for joining us today on this session, and I will leave the mic to Daniele. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, as, a, as already anticipated by the title, today we are going to explain you how we can do explainable predictive decisioning in a way so that we combine ML and decision management to promote trust in automated decision making. First, step back. When we discuss about AI, in reality, we have a lot of different type of AI, and it's not that trivial to be on the same page in terms of, okay, what do we mean with AI? Traditionally, I would say the more, the, maybe the first definition of AI was essentially what usually is called a pure AI. So it means an AI machine, so a machine that can replace completely a human for any type of task. Well, that type of AI, uh, there are research, this is from two years, almost three years ago, estimated that uh, we will have a chance to achieve a similar AI in more than 150 and 25 years from now. Mm -hmm. So it means that uh, we are quite far from uh, a, an AI that, it's, uh, that can completely replace human. But this doesn't mean that we cannot already use uh, and benefit from AI system. So let's introduce another definition of AI that is the pragmatic AI. In this type of AI, uh, we define a set of building block technologies. So digital decisioning, mathematical optimization, natural language processing, machine learning, robotics, all those building blocks provide a specific type of feature. And uh, combining them, we can already solve a business problem and we can already automate leverage AI technology. We cannot replace in all the type of scenario, but those building blocks are already quite powerful. In particular, our definition of pragmatic approach to predictive decision automation is the way to combine machine learning technology, building block, digital decisioning, and mathematical optimization. Uh, with machine learning, we have the possibility to extract data from, uh, from extract information from data. So we have usually already a lot of data. Uh, that uh, when the user maybe interact with the website or uh, with our mobile app, we can use that to, for example, learn user uh, behavior and the user similarity. So we can realize that there are, uh, we can cluster user and classify user and say, okay, we realize that all those users seems to be interested to the same type of product. So I can build a recommender, so I can try to sell additional product based on their behavior. At the same time with digital decisioning, I can define my set of rules. Usually I have, in my business a set of rules because I can decide that I wanted to promote a specific type of product even if maybe it's not the best match but it's because uh, it's strategic for our comp company so we wanted to uh, be uh, wanted to expand our market in a specific type of product so we can decide to tune this information or at the same time we can use it to define which the best way to engage our customer so we can define that maybe we realize that okay I have my uh, my system and the customer decided that uh, it doesn't want to receive any mail, want to only see uh, messages or notification. Or even I can apply uh, regular um, additional uh, constraint, like uh, I don't want to promote, provide uh, a suggestion on a product that the user already bought in the past. Uh, so I can add, add a lot of many different uh, uh, digital decisioning aspect that usually are human driven, human knowledge and expertise. At the same time, I can also leverage mathematical optimization to optimize my, for example, uh, the shipping of my product. So I am in uh, e-commerce, e I was able to create a recommender. This recommender was enriched, has been enriched with digital decisioning, and now I have to provide my, my, uh, my product to the customer and they want to optimize my uh, my shipping chain so that I'm able to achieve, to reach the customer really fast because now the market, uh, uh, if you have, a, you are, if you're using an e-commerce and you cannot ship in, I don't know, more than, in, uh, in uh, more than uh, 25 hours, sometimes say, okay, I will just use a different shop. So th those kind of optim optimization can be really crucial to be successful successfully in your, uh, in your type of market. The approach that we follow uh, in Red Hat in general, we will uh, we think we'll, uh, believe in open source and in open standard, and we try to use and, and embrace them as much as we can. And uh, traditionally, there has been uh, a lot of standardization or attempt to standardize uh, different aspects of a business domain on a business automation domain to try to cover those gaps. So we have on one side business automation, so we have a business that has a problem, a business problem to solve. And the other side, we also now have machine learning that uh, usually it's a quite uh, uh, mathematical approach. So it's quite 
add to make those kind of different type of people personas that com communicate. So, for example, there is a CMMN and the BPMN a standard that help to model case and processes uh, of your business problem. Then we have a DMN and PMML that is a way to model with DMN a decision. And with PML, it's a way to serialize a, a machine learning model. And those two standards work really well together. And this is the focus of this presentation. We're going to show you how we can take a decision, we can uh, um, take a model, and we can uh, use them together. The benefit of this integration is the fact that uh, we are able to provide the proper tool for each persona. So we have a decision modeler that uh, it's used to an Excel-like environment. So a spreadsheet, a decision table. So a similar environment, it's a good fit for a decision modeler because uh, he knows how to model, uh, specify all the information that he knows. At the same time, for a data scientist, they are definitely much, much more confident using uh, uh, an environment like R, like uh, Python, uh, Jupyter Notebook. So we wanted to enable this type of, uh, this type of relation. And PML, it's the, the lingua franca that we can use to make them communicate. This, uh, this approach, even if we are now going to show you a specific example, in reality, is not really that specific as approach because it applies to, I would say, the majority of the business problem that you have. Because uh, you have essentially a problem. Every time you have a problem where you wanted to extract information from your data using ML, that you wanted to reach this, this, this information to make a, a proper decision. So I have this classification, so I know that now the customer is classified as a gold. Then I can make a decision. Okay, if, if it's gold, I can apply maybe a specific pricing. So I can make a decision based on a, that ML. Uh, and this is true, for example, for fraud detection, for customer loyalty scoring, for uh, efficient customer service management, predictive customer attention. So all those type of uh, user interaction can fit with this approach. Now I'm going to hand over the, uh, to Matteo so that he can proceed and, and show the scenario. Thank you, Daniele, for this introduction. And indeed, uh, to see that uh, those open standards and those concepts in action today, let's try to focus on which are the business flows that normally you have in the industry and maybe in your business as well, and how we can apply this open standard in the specific detail. So on one side, uh, here in this slide, we have highlighted two flows. So on one side, we have the decision automation flow. Here is where we start with your business relevant data. In the example of the e-commerce that Daniele was making earlier, this could be your customer that is and his, uh, the, um, the basket bin of uh, the items that uh, is uh, shopping off. And then, then these, uh, we want to make some decision about it. Or as well, it could be a prospect, uh, somebody who's asking the loan, and therefore this will be the credit score and the application data for uh, the loan, specific loan, the specific credit that uh, this person is applying to. So with this data, we want to implement a decision model that is normally in charge of the business analyst working with the business stakeholder to define. And here is where we can make use of the DMN open standard. It's an open standard that we will see can really benefit for getting this requirement and getting this model, this operational decision encoded with this open standard. And the result of this is that you will be able to reason on your business data and to make a decision, normally an operational one. This decision in turn translate into a business relevant action. So here is where you will offer a discount to the customer or you may choose if to delegate for this loan application to some higher level of support or you can automatically approve the loan request because it's a low amount and a low risk. So in turn, these uh, action drive the business, but as well will generate some new data, a returning customer, a new application for a loan and so on. On another side, we have the typical flow of the machine learning and knowledge discover activity. Here is where we start still again with business data. The key difference could be that uh, not only you could rely on structured data, you could also have unstructured one. You can uh, start to reason about uh, images, videos, audio, anything that you can think of. And all these structured and unstructured documents feed into the machine learning activity, as you know, in order to provide a predictive model a model that in turn will be put into production in order to make use of it and to make a prediction on your data. So here is where, for instance, you can really have the implementation of the recommender system for the um, online shop that Daniele was mentioning earlier. Here you can have a predictive model for a risk for a specific uh, client and so on. Again, as very well know, 
the predictive model once it's put into production may lose uh, um, some precision so you may have to retrain the model and of course both flow provide um, forecast for these uh, feedback loops the key point that we would like to highlight today is how you can integrate both the predictive machine learning model and the decision model to make the best use of this both world. The demo that we're going to see today is about a credit card dispute, meaning in the demo, the credit card is the institute, so the bank, it's, um, it's offering its client, as usual, the option to dispute a credit card transaction. And here is the business process, one of the open standards, that actually support this, uh, this process for the bank. We will start with a credit fraud that is being submitted as a request from the, from the client. And here is one key part. We want to make some key relevant business decision whether to uh, proceed on this, on this process in an automatic fashion or in a manual way. If you proceed automatically, then the sub-process is very lean, but if instead it requires some manual interaction, for instance, some review from by the bank clerk, then it, as you can see, it requires more steps. So this will be much longer. So here is the, is the process, but what is the, how we can make the decision whether we can, or we can, we decided to process this automatically or manually. Normally, analytically, this is done by defining some decision table, in this case, to support the risk estimation. The, credit, uh, the um, decision table are a visual paradigm where you would have the input columns, so your input data, your features, on the left-hand side of the table, and the decision, so the output value, on the right. Let's see one example here. We have uh, a couple of decision tables. One is in charge of estimating the inherent risk for the cardholder, what another one is uh, to estimate the dispute risk. So how much this transaction is risky to be disputed for the bank? Let's see one specific example. If I'm a standard customer of this bank and I'm disputing for less than $25, then here the business analyst in agreement with the business stakeholder have put a low value, in this case, a value of one. While if I'm still a standard customer, and I'm disputing a, a transaction amount between $25 and $150, then the, the business analysts here have decided to have a greater value, three. So in this case, to signify that it's more risky. So this is pretty simple, and this is the way that has been done traditionally in an analytical way. But in 2020, we can do much better than that, and we can do actually more precise and more efficient prediction using machine learning. Here, we will still reason on structured data, so the data that is incoming, but as well some unstructured data that the bank might be in possession, which is really benefiting from the pool of all the transactions that have run through the institute, of all the credit card disputes that has always been happening in the past, of all the customer that the bank is leaning from, and actually external data sources as well. One key takeaway, however, is that the machine learning activity that we are uh, trying to promote today, it doesn't change from what you normally do. Here you would still use your preferred uh, Python framework like TensorFlow or R or Spark, the, uh, or Python, uh, uh, um, any other Python framework. The key point, however, is that you, you, know, you recognize that the output of this activity is to make, to produce a predictive model. Instead of persisting the predictive model in a proprietary format, we are suggesting, hey, you can actually save that, and many frameworks actually allow you to do that, in an open standard such as PMML. And once you save and persist the predictive model in this, in, with this open standard, then you can really put and benefit into production with the interaction that we've seen today. So I will switch now to the demo to show you to you in action. Here we start from the perspective of the customer of the bank. I'm logging into the bank portal. You can see my status. I'm a platinum member. You can see my um, uh, overall amount that I have in the bank. And as I start to see the credit card transaction history, then I recognize that something is off. So I'm going to dispute this specific credit card transaction. As I click this button, here behind the scene, I have that business process that we have defined that is providing the step that as a user, I'm fingering out. These are the data that the bank is requiring. In this case, I'm entering the reason for the credit trans card transaction. 
And as I finish, you see that it gives me a, a case ID. So number four. So this is how we're going to remember this ID because we are going to see behind the scene what has been happening on Business Central, which is the platform that support this process execution and uh, why uh, we will have some, some, some return on it. So I'm connecting to Business Central now. And uh, one of the things that I would like to, to revise here is uh, to really overview uh, in a little bit more detail the uh, process for this credit card dispute. So the moment that I started to dispute it, I started the process with the, with the box that you see in the upper left corner. So as soon as I started, actually behind the scene, there has been some decision task. Here is where we will use the decision model to actually decide, okay, is this dispute transaction to be resolved automatically or to require some manual reviews? And uh, as we noticed, in the automatic way is the one that I would lean, I would prefer uh, if, uh, if, if possible, because otherwise any manual intervention, as you can see, it requires much more uh, steps. It requires also some human interaction with the credit card, uh, sorry, with the bank clerk to revise and to eventually feedback. So let's see what has specifically happened with that uh, instance. So ID number four, you see here, and uh, here is the ID in, in this uh, screen, but then, Let's see on the diagram what has happened. Here you can see in gray highlighted color the steps, the flow, the path that the process have taken. So with the business process management notation, we can really support this and show to you which step that the process has been enacting. But let's see now why the decision was, okay, we can process this automatically. Because you can see here is the process variable that I was through. So, here you see some data. I am a platinum of the bank. The user was a platinum of the bank. And you can see the credit card transaction that has been disputed, $44. Now, let's start to see a couple of risk estimation. The dispute risk is pretty low, is one. And also the cardholder risk is pretty low, again, is one. Here are, and we will see now, are the part that I've done in a first step with an analytical decision table and both support the final decision, which is, is uh, this uh, dispute can be transacted automatically or manually. So this is how the process has been interacting with the decision model in order to decide uh, how to deal with this uh, dispute. We can go now and see, okay, what is happening behind the scene of the decision model? And so here I'm accessing the specific asset uh, here that, uh, that disputed that uh, decision model. And uh, here we can see that the key, uh, key point, the key decision formalizing the MN is if to process this uh, transaction automatically or manually. There are two sub decision or two supporting decision. One is uh, the dispute risk estimation and one is the cardholder risk estimation as we've seen briefly earlier. But we can see more details now. So we can drill down and see the table that are actually here is live on the system. And we can see indeed also the specific row that has been triggered. So because I'm a platinum member and I've disputed for less than $100, 45 and whatever, then the dispute risk is pretty low, is one. So this is the way that I, I could do before, uh, before machine learning integration. And the same would happen for the cardholder risk. But here is a one key point. What is a, this a decision uh, telling us? Well, here in, in layman term is that if both the dispute risk are below a certain threshold, then we can transact it automatically. You see, it's basically just trying to ensure that both uh, risks are below a certain threshold. So this is the key part. You can use decision model to actually formalize what are the policy that you want to implement. Okay, but now we can do one step more. Now we want to actually replace those decision, analytical decision table with machine learning predictive model. This is because we can have much more reasonable and sensible estimation about both risk because we can leverage really all the benefit from the machine learning activity. So what uh, I should do here is that out of the machine learning we have learned, we can persist the predictive model in an open standard such as PMML. And I've already uploaded that to Business Central, the system that you see now on the screen, already for you. So here are 
the dispute risk estimation and the cardholder risk estimation with a couple of machine learning algorithms persisted as PMML file. And now we are going to integrate those machine learning predictive model inside of the DMN, the decision model, to actually plug in these, uh, these models inside my decision model. So in uh, what I normally could do here is that as a business analyst, uh, I got the benefit of this uh, editor uh, in Business Central, and uh, we provide to you a very simple editor, uh, sorry, very simple capabilities that uh, would allow the business analyst to integrate the PMML model with DMN. The editor provides you a guided a wizard, uh, basically to integrate uh, those tools. So in this case, I'm linking, okay, I want to use the dispute machine learning model for linear regression in this decision model. And here, what I need to do is that, okay, now, for the dispute risk estimation, I want to use that predictive model. In DMN, we don't have the time to, to do a crash course on DMN today, but uh, what you would normally do is that you would define a function that calls this predictive model. And the specification, the open standard DMN, already um, envisage it uh, from the standard specification. So what we do is that we make life simpler for the business analyst uh, by providing really editor capabilities that can integrate DMN and PMML together in an easy way. So as you can see here, I'm navigating, I'm using the dispute machine learning model. And uh, now another key aspect is that I don't want maybe to, to check what's inside the, the model itself, but I want to know which are the inputs and which are the outputs that we get. As soon as I select it, so as soon as I will select the predictive model that is inside, that PMML file, you will see that the editor now provided immediately for me the input, so the feature that uh, are needed to, to be fed inside of the predictive model to make the estimation. And now here, normally what you will do is that uh, in DMN, you will do a needle refactoring. Uh, in the interest of time today, we don't have the, uh, the, all the time to, to spend here to see in the details. But basically, like the, in the best cooking show do, I have already prepared it on the side. There are two variations of this uh, decision model. As you can see, the structure is overall the same. You want to decide if to process automatically or manually based on two sub-supporting decisions, the dispute risk estimation and the cardholder risk estimation. And those are already being refactored to make use of the machine learning predictive model persisted with PMML, as you can see there. So with now this uh, uh, available, what I can do is that I can go back to the uh, BPMN file for the process and say, now for that decision task, I want to use the decision model that make use of the predictive model. And here is how you can combine the standard all together in the way that Daniele has been introducing you in the introduction. So in the editor is pretty simple. You go back to the decision task and you simply change the name of the DMN model. In this case, I'm using one of the two availables that integrates with the PMML. And as soon as I save it, here it will be, again, pretty simple. I can save it and push into production. Of course, this is done for the purpose of the demo because especially in banks, you wouldn't uh, let uh, that one person is in can have the access to all the buttons to push to production. But here is to show the capabilities that uh, you really have available and you can decide how to best delegate and integrate. So now what we can do is that we can go back to the same front end application of the customer for the bank and see how the scenario would play out now that we've changed that decision model. So again, I connect, I'm a platinum member, I can see my, my status in the bank. I see the transaction card history and I want to dispute this one. As you will see, the flow for disputing this transaction remains unchanged. This is the thing that we expect. But as soon as I will feed uh, again all the data that the bank is requiring to me, I get a sign and dining ID. In this case, ID number five. So we can go back on Business Central now and see, okay, what has been happening behind the scene and what is the result of this? So as I move back, I can go and check in my process instances, which are these, uh, these process that I just completed, ID number five, as we expected. And as you can see here, is ID number five. And again, if I go into the diagram, oh yeah, 
the, the same uh, flows has been integrated. And this is what we expect. The key difference here now is that for the dispute risking and for the card holder inherent risk, I got a different values. And these are not values that uh, business analyst would enter in the decision table. And this is where we really integrate we have integrated the decision model with the predictive model. So we've changed the decision model to make use of the machine learning result in order to make a more uh, efficient estimation for this risk. So this take into account all the machine learning activities that the data scientists of the bank institute have done. And so we get indeed the, the same outcome but now it's governed and driven by machine learning under the, the same decision model. So the, thing, the key point of the policy, which is under a certain threshold, I still transact this dispute automatically has been respected. Of course, we, with all of this being available on the OpenShift, we have both operational and business metrics. In the interest of time, I will Keep ahead because also Daniele will speak a little about this more. But uh, we can offer as well the Grafana dashboard for KPI and metrics. What is important about this dashboard is that we can offer KPI and metrics to both operations, but also as well to the business. In this case, this dashboard has an upper part, which is how many transactions have been disputed automatically versus manually. And of course, this is the ratio that we would expect. But also we can see the distribution with this heat map graph about what is the dispute risk estimation and the cardholder risk estimation by varying the decision model behind the scene. So this is the decision model with the decision table. And, but I can simulate what happens to the system as well if I change the decision model that make use of the machine learning predictive model. And as you can see, the overall result will be the same, except that the dispute risk now changes, shifted in the distribution for the dispute risk estimation. So this can be a feedback to the data scientists and to revise the machine learning model in order to come up to another variation again, where we're still having the same, uh, the same concept, like I want to govern the risk threshold and below I will transact it automatically, but now the machine learning predictive model have a variation for this risk that is more compatible with what we are used to seeing. So to recap what we've seen, we've seen a decision model that can make use of the machine learning predictive model in order to govern a main policy for the bank. In this case, under a certain threshold, I want to process it automatically and integrate the sub supporting decision with an open standard such as PMML. Here is where the two standards, the two open standards, DMN and PMML shine because they can shine together. Here we've shown how we can integrate DMN and how the specification entails capability to connect with the machine learning predictive model of PMML. And what we do to make the life easier for your business analyst is to provide editor capabilities that allow that integration to be as smooth as possible. We also offer, the, there is no time to go into detail today, but we also offer a scenario simulation tool for ensuring no regression testing. Here is where you can encode, in a way, the scenarios, the requirements that your business stakeholder ask you, and make sure that whatever underlying implementation of models you do, you still have uh, the expected outcome in the way that uh, the stakeholder have uh, asked you to implement. We have seen briefly the, the Grafana dashboard and how we can use it for both operational and business KPI matrix. And finally, all this demo has been running on the OpenShift container platform. So we've shown how we can use Red Hat's process automation manager to govern the knowledge asset, the BPMN, the DMN, the PMML file, and how we can use the decision server in that to actually enact those process, enact those decisions, and run the machine learning predictive model. Uh, we've shown to you how to make a matrix uh, with uh, Grafana, and as well, the banking application is still hosted on the OpenShift container platform. And now I will uh, get it back to Daniele, who will show to you a little bit more how to improve confidence. Thanks, Matteo. Uh, after uh, this point of the presentation, we've already shown how to take a model, combine a model, use a model, and also provide some information. But uh, 
At this point, we also realize that there are sometimes some aspects that it's uh, that we probably need something more, or that maybe can have where we can provide uh, additional support. So, especially if you uh, combine AI in terms of machine learning technology, sometimes the result could be quite not unpredictable. Especially when it happens that in production you will use the model that has been trained with a set of data with a, in a new data that was not available during the training phase so that the model is, is not, has not been tested with that specific value. So this is a quite, let's say, simple and, and funny example where there was a, a, a AI camera that has been trained to follow the ball in a, in a football game in a Scotland, uh, I think, in a Scotland TV channel. But uh, they were probably not being trained with uh, considering that uh, there is people that are bold. And uh, at that point, uh, the, uh, the camera started and instead of follow the ball, follow the referee. So in this case, this is just a simple example. And of course, it was mainly, uh, of course, it was a sort of fun uh, outcome. But uh, if you have uh, maybe a system that uh, approve your loan and uh, you will just have your loan and not approved because of a similar uh, error, you want on both sides you want to have the control so on end user side you want to understand why and on the service provider side you want to prevent a similar scenario so there are also this type of constraint or this kind of uh, condition uh, are uh, let's say in general a good idea but uh, they are also started to be imposed at companies with different type of regulation gdpr is probably the most famous one in, in europe it's not the only one and of course, uh, it's a quite big and complex uh, type of uh, field. And uh, the, uh, the law cannot go in details like uh, I can use uh, a neural network, but I cannot use something different. Uh, so can you move next to the next slide? Uh, so in general, it just provides general principle like uh, uh, you need to provide meaningful information about the logic involved. Or at the same time, as, as user, I need to be able to, to challenge that decision. So it's not enough that uh, the, the, the company say, sorry, this is the outcome because the algorithm said so. So I needed to pro provide information. And again, the user can say, OK, I don't think that uh, you apply the proper logic. And I wanted to, 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 um, to dispute the, that decision. Uh, so. That all those kind of aspects, uh, we tried to consider them when we created the Trust AI initiative. So with Trust AI initiative, the goal was uh, to offer value-added value-added services to for business automation. And uh, to do that, to obtain a similar scenario, you have to have a proper monitoring. So you needed to real, to discover the situation that maybe is starting to behave in a way that is what's not expected. At the same time, you needed to collect trace and accountability information. Because if you wanted to go back and do an analysis or maybe train again your model, you need to collect those data. Because otherwise, even in case of dispute, uh, you, you don't know exactly what happened because you just have maybe the complaint or the final outcome that is completely uh, black box. Like, okay, the loan has been rejected, but you don't know the input, you don't know the internal mechanism logic, you don't know the risk value that has been calculated. And in addition, there are uh, explainable AI algorithms that uh, it's a field uh, of research that try to define algorithms that try to describe or in general provide information about the internal mechanism of the model, even if it's a black box. So I can provide information and those information try to explain why a specific decision has been made. To do that, uh, we get uh, the, this uh, Cogito initial, okay. Uh, Cogito is uh, the next gen cloud uh, native business automation solution. So, a technology that we uh, in Red Hat created, uh, it has been created, started, like I would say, more or less two years ago, uh, to take the technology, take the, the knowledge that we already have, uh, and try to make it uh, work as a first class citizen in a cloud native environment. So, it means uh, to be strictly integrated with Kubernetes, with Quarkus, with OpenShift, of course. Kafka, so leverage the new technology, the new paradigm shift. So traditionally, our service, all in general, those kind of services were sort of monolithic, monolithic service that provide all your knowledge in a, with a single executor. Now, we have a, a microservice approach. So it means that you have your Cogito application that contains a specific set of knowledge and decision processes. Uh, in JVM or native mode, and then you have a lot of additional services that provide additional capability. 
uh, like the job service if you needed to, for example, if you have a timer, or the data indexer if you wanted to provide some reporting. So instead of having a single component, uh, this kind of flexibility gives us the possibility to scale each specific component. So it means that uh, if you have, for example, an I, you needed to provide a really deep analysis, you don't need to scale your runtime. Your runtime will proceed uh, as expected uh, uh, before. Uh, we just need to provide to scale maybe the data index. And this is a sort of a, a out of the box in OpenShift container platform. Trusty services, so trusty ecosystem, it's part of this ecosystem. So we provide microservices that can be used, of course, in the, together with Cogito application to enrich your uh, decision logic with those, all, all those aspects, monitoring, tracing, and explainability. Another key aspect that we were considered since the beginning for Trusty, and in general, especially when you, when you approach explainability, is that in reality, you wanted to provide not the same explainability, the same explanation to everyone. You want to provide the right tool to the right stakeholder. So it means that if I'm a data scientist, usually I needed to have something that could be really technical, but at the same time, usually I don't have a really deep domain knowledge. So I know, I understand the model, I can understand uh, uh, if the model has uh, some specific uh, strange behavior, but uh, I don't know maybe the in-business impact of a similar behavior. On the, on completely on the other opposite, we have maybe the compliance worker or the bank manager that has uh, an high level understanding of, uh, uh, sorry, a good high level understanding of the domain knowledge. So I know exactly the business impact if uh, my, for example, uh, my loan will not be approved because I, have the, I know the impact in terms of business. At the same time, I don't have technical knowledge. So if I provide you uh, an, an explanation that it's too technical, uh, it, it's useless. The case worker, it's uh, sort of in the middle because usually it's the one that know exactly how to handle a specific case-by-case uh, -case domain. So in a loan, I know exactly how to fill a loan request. I don't know the business the impact uh, in the general speaking. So I don't know, for example, what's the impact on the company, but I know exactly what I'm doing. So the type of explanation that need, we need to provide, it's different. Business monitoring, I will go through quite quickly because it's similar to what Matteo already shown uh, in, in advance. And now what we uh, do in addition is that we automatically generate those dashboards based on the information that we extract from the model. So if your model has two different uh, decisions that provide uh, uh, a Boolean, like approved or reject, we can plot, we can provide those metrics so that we can show, you can see the, the, the flow of each of those decisions. Operational monitoring, it's from a microservice perspective, of course, you wanted to make sure that your system is healthy. So it means that, the, for example, the uh, number of requests that uh, for each endpoint it's uh, below a certain threshold or in general, the latency, it's under control. If, even that type of the monitoring is provided out of the box considering the information that we, that we expose. Let's introduce quickly a, a, credit card, a, a use case, a credit card approval uh, scenario. So I am a customer, I am in front of my case worker, I apply for a credit card, my, my request has been rejected and I'm asking for why. So I wanted to understand why this, this credit card request has been approved, uh, rejected. The case worker can access the audit UI where it can look at not only the final outcome, but also the intermediate result. So not only approved true or false, but also for in this case, the level of confidence that it's already a good information like, okay, this, this decision has been made considering a specific level of uh, confidence. The audit UI also provides explainability. It means that we are able to sort and extract feature importance information. So it means that for each decision, so for this, this specific execution that you're looking at, you can, you can see the information about uh, the feature that had the most positive and most negative impact. So for example, you can extract the information about what are the feature that maybe uh, were considered most important to have this card uh, reject. And uh, usually are the information that the, the, the end user needs to understand how, how can he tune or how can change the information. Like, okay, maybe I need to provide a new grant or, or maybe I can try to change my information to have the, 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 the loan approved, the credit card approved, sorry. Uh, just this is just a, a, a final slide so that we collect uh, some of resources. 
You can find uh, the demo that Matteo did uh, available on YouTube. You can find more information about uh, what is DMN, how, how to learn DMN, also what is Cogito, and then as a, an introduction and also a deep dive on Trust AI initiative and technologies. Uh, and finally, of course, all those technologies are open source, but uh, as a result, we provide uh, professional uh, services. So you can, if you're interested, you can find the link in the, in the slide. I think that this was the last slide, correct, Matteo? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that I don't know if there is any question or comment. We have probably another few minutes. Okay. Which AI, yeah, I see in the chat that uh, I can answer live. Which AI algorithm are used to generate the audit UI? Uh, our uh, audit, uh, our explainability toolkit supports a different uh, algorithm. We implemented Lime, Sharp, and we also have uh, a solution for contrafactual. So it means uh, we can provide a what if scenario. So uh, change the output, provide me the range of uh, the changes that I can do, and the engine will automatically produce an input, so altering the data to have uh, this kind of information. In particular, for the, for the audit UI, we implemented the Lime algorithm. Uh, but uh, with some specific change to make it work uh, in our context, because uh, we considering that we are targeting a decision service, we usually don't have a uh, training information. So usually we don't know exactly uh, because it's domain driven. So if the user defined that the threshold is uh, five, uh, this, I don't have training data to justify this information. It's a domain aspect. So. For that audit UI, for that uh, explainability, we are using uh, this algorithm, while the other algorithms are accessible for a data scientist. And we plan to expose other features to in the audit UI or in similar tool based on the based on the persona. So our goal is that we implement the, the algorithm part so that we can provide those information, but at the same time, define a feature end-to-end, -end, understand if this is a good fit, so can answer a question that uh, a case worker or a compliant worker can uh, can understand and in this way integrating the platform.